let us start with the chant. Om Bhadram Karne Bhi Shrinuyama Deva Bhadram Pashe Maksha Bhirya Jatra Sthirai Rangai Tushtuvagam Sastanu Bhi Vyashema Deva Hitayadayahu Swastina Indro Vridhashravaha Swastinaf Pusha Vishwaveda Swastinas Tark Show Arishta Nemi Swastino Brihaspatir Dadhatu Om Shanti 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 So problem is samsara and solution is freedom from samsara. And samsara is characterized by unhappiness, lack of fulfillment. Freedom from samsara should be happiness, lasting, profound, deep fulfillment. In religion and um, in philosophy, this samsara and freedom from samsara are understood at different levels. A conventional understanding in religion, different religions of the world, is this is samsara. What is this samsara? This world. And freedom from samsara is something like a heaven which is elsewhere, in some other place, not this place, else when, not now, some other time, um, in, in the future. And uh, not this thing. So separated from this by desha kala vastu. Desha means place. Separated from this by time and separated from this by object. Object means it is not this thing. This is samsara and something else is uh, freedom or heaven. Here is samsara and there is freedom. Now is samsara and later, maybe after death or after illumination or after something will be freedom. In <coughs> In the Advaita Vedanta, <coughs> in the Mandukya Upanishad, samsara is understood as dvaita, duality. And freedom or liberation is understood as advaitam, moksha, is, is non-duality. What is duality? <coughs> duality is, no, it's not right. Duality is difference. When I see myself as a limited being, I am different from you. And all this world is different from me. Immediately what comes? Likes and dislikes. So what is good for this being, I like. What is, is unpleasant for this being, I dislike. In Sanskrit, this is called Raga Dvesha. Raga means attraction. Dvesha means repulsion, dislike. And that which I am attracted towards, I try to get it, I try to enjoy it, I try to possess it. So I go towards that as it were, I engage in that activity. That is in Sanskrit called pravritti. And that which repels, uh, repels me, that which I find unpleasant for myself. Um, it could be unpleasant for the body, something and uncomfortable in my, maybe it's too hot or too cold. It could be unpleasant for the mind. You know, something that is insulting, something that is demeaning or, or, um, and so on. So all these things I try to go away from. In Sanskrit, this is called nivritti. Moving towards, moving away from. And as I do this, I engage in karma. And karma gives rise to results. This is the doctrine of karma. You do something, you get a result. Action and reaction. There is a result. Causality is set in motion. Causality is a subtle but very powerful force. What we do, it generates results. Once karma is set in motion, the results of karma are certain. That they are going to come, now or later. If you have set a cause in motion, the effect is going to come. Um, if the cause is good, so good and bad comes in at this stage. Um, you know, the concepts of dharma and adharma, good and bad, good and evil. 
So if the, our karma is good, then the results will be good. Good karma is called dharma and the result will be, good result is sukha, happiness, pleasure. Bad karma is called adharma and there means consciously done, deliberately done wrong things and the result is unhappiness. If you ask, why would anybody do bad karma if, if that results in unhappiness? Why wouldn't everybody do good karma? The reason is, why are we doing karma at all? What was just before karma? What was just before karma? What comes just before karma? Why are we engaging in karma? Because of pravritti and nivritti, that we are moving towards something, I want something and I, um, I try to get away from other things. And why do I want something and why do I want to get away from something else? What was before that? Raga dvesha, attraction and repulsion. Now imagine, if the attraction or repulsion are too much, unmanageable, I will overstep the limits of morality and ethics. Uh, I will, I knowingly, I might do things which are wrong because I can't, can't control myself. Maybe the attraction is too much or maybe the anger or hatred is too much. So I react out of greed or lust or hatred or anger and I do adharma. So that's why people, see people do not do wrong things as a, as a matter of principle. You know, out of um, uh, <laughs> completely unselfishly, uh, out of the goodness of my heart, I am robbing people and murder, murdering. No, but it just sounds ridiculous. People do it because they're impelled from within by these forces of good and bad. Um, so, by these forces of attraction and repulsion. And once dharma and adharma, good karma and bad karma are set in motion, the results are certain. And these results are seen in this life, or if not in this life, in lives to come. That leads to birth and rebirth. Now look at the chain. Look at the chain. Birth and rebirth. This life is going on. Why? Propelled by karma. Good and bad karma. Why is this good and bad karma? Because I have done dharma and adharma. Uh, why have I done dharma and adharma? Because I have pravritti and nivritti. I go towards something and I withdraw from other things. Why do I do that? Because I have likes and dislikes. I have needs. Why? Because at the root of it is dvaita. I see myself as a limited individual separated from the entire universe. So that is the analysis of samsara in Advaita Vedanta. In Advaita Vedanta, samsara is dvaita, duality. And the solution to this is? Solution to <laughs> non-duality. And according to Advaita Vedanta, this non-duality, this solution to samsara is right here. It's not there. It's here. Non-duality is here. Duality is samsara, which is obviously here. But non-duality is also here. It's not then. It's right now. Non-duality is right now. And it's not that thing, it is this thing itself, what we are experiencing right now. Right here, right now, and this itself is the non-dual reality. This is the, the stunning claim of Advaita Vedanta. That raises the question, if this itself, right now, right here, is non-dual, we, we clearly see it as duality. If this is non-dual, then what is going on? Why am I not able to realize this as, as non-duality? The difference is knowledge and ignorance. In ignorance, this reality, this non-duality is experienced as a duality and leading to samsara. In knowledge, in knowledge, this very reality is experienced or realized as non-dual leading to freedom from samsara. I have summed up the whole thing. You can go home now. <laughs> Wait a minute, what, so if knowledge is the key thing, then how do I get this knowledge? That's why we are here. Let's see, how do we get this knowledge? So, Gaurapada has been, yes. Sorry, uh, so, can a thought be considered as karma? Yes, consciously thinking thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. And no, but, yeah. So, like, uh, the reason I'm asking you is like, you know, I've started to notice that I have these thoughts which just arise and... How do I sort of replace this stuff? Like now, yeah, I'm yeah. stage where I'm catching it. Good, good. Uh, so, this is what we will talk about today. Um, in fact, this question about managing or spiritualizing the mind is going to come up today. Yeah. 
But there is one point here. The Holy Mother says, Kali Juge Moner Paap Paap Noy. In the uh, age of Kali, this, this age, this grand time we are living in, uh, a sin of the mind is not to be considered a sin of the mind. But that doesn't give you a blank check. Why? The reason is, whatever we consciously do, that means mentally, verbally or physically, it sets up forces. So if I mentally give permission for my mind to think certain thoughts which are undesirable, uh, I am automatically limiting my future choices because a tendency is set up in the mind. Next time it will be much more difficult to control. If I automatically start using curse words, uh, I am already conditioning my way of speaking. Next it will be difficult for me to control my speech. And if I actually physically start doing these things, whether good or bad, it will set up a habit. So even if, so for example, Holy Mother would not regard a mental um, act as bad karma. She doesn't. But it certainly sets forces in motion. It makes it all that more difficult for to, to do a good act next. Or to, opposite also holds true. Good thoughts, noble thoughts. I was reading Swami Turiyananda, reminiscences of Swami Turiyananda. He says, Ultimately, it's very simple. Uh, in Bengali, he said, uh, in, the translation is, only the one who <coughs> is immersed in high and noble thoughts, who can entertain in high and noble thoughts, will be saved in the end. It all boils down to that. Uh, it's a, it's a, actually, practically, it boils down to what you said, just the mind itself. The rest follows. So if you immerse yourself in high thoughts, in noble thoughts, if you can hold on to that, your life will be tra transformed. I was reading, The Quality of Life is written by one Winifred Gallagher and she faced cancer. And she said that at one time it became too much. The treatments and the pain and the, the unpleasantness of it all, the financial problems. So I just decided I'm not going to think about it. She started thinking about her work. I think she was an artist or writer, something like that. And then she said, I made this remarkable discovery. This lady, Winifred Gallagher. Um, I made this remarkable discovery. The quality of my life is not something outside. I realized the quality of my life is, she said two things. What I think about, where I put my mind, and how much of my mind I put in that. If I think about my pain and suffering and I put most of my mind there, my quality of life will be horrible. In the same situation, if I think about my writing and put most of my mind there, he said, my quality of life, fighting cancer is actually dramatically better than what it was before cancer. Before I was just unconsciously drifting along, doing this and that. Now, under the pressure, under this terrible crisis, I had to make a, an effort. Quality of life depends on what you think about and how much you think about it. Yes, these two things. Where you put your mind. So Sri Ramakrishna suffering, dying from cancer. All his mind is given to God. He's thinking about God and with all of his mind. We are just reading in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna yesterday. M says to Sri Ramakrishna that few days ago somebody had come and you were pacing in your room. And this person, visitor, first time visitor, he, says, he looked at you and he said that he is the happiest man I've ever seen in my life. And he just felt like that seeing this. Who is this man who is going to die in a few days out of terminal cancer? How is that possible? Where I put my mind and how much of my mind I put there? Yeah. We'll come back to it. It is relevant to today's discussion. Now Gaurapada says, Alright, so dualism is the root. You understand how dualism is the root of uh, uh, samsara? Uh, as I said, dualism means difference. Difference means likes and dislikes. Likes and dislikes means activity towards something and away from something. And that leads to dharma and adharma. Dharma and adharma leads to the result karma phala, good and bad, pleasant and unpleasant. And that leads to many lives. So this is the general way they look at it. Duality, dvaita is at the root. Difference, a sense of difference. So oneness is the solution. Nothing new. That's what we have been studying all along. In fact, if you want to put it in the language of the Mandukya Upanishad, which you have studied, where is duality? In waking. Waker and waker's world, Dvaita, duality. Dreamer and dreamer's world, Dvaita, duality. 
deep sleeper and deep sleeper's blankness. You'll say there's no duality there, no experienced duality. It's just one mass of blankness, uh, deep sleep. But the seed of duality is there, the bija. It's called the seed state because it comes back. All of it comes back when you wake up. So waking, dreaming, deep sleep are all duality. Waking and dreaming are actual duality and deep sleep is potential duality. It is the Turiya which is non-dual. The underlying one consciousness in which all of these appear and disappear. That one is non-dual. There is no duality there. So Turiya is freedom. Turiya is moksha. Turiya is our real nature. Turiya is non-dual. Okay. Now, Gaudapada goes deeper. He says, all right, this is all very nice. This is very philosophical. This is very uh, abstract in a in certain sense. Very practical to Gaudapada, but most of us will say, can't you tell us something more, a little more? But we can get our, seek, sink our teeth into. So Gaudapada says, here goes. Notice the last two verses we did. We did 29 and 38, we've done it last time. Yatha swapne dvaya bhasam spandate maya manaha Tatha jagradvaya bhasam spandate maya manaha As maya, through the instrumentation of the mind, vibration of the mind, appears as a duality in, in dreams. What do I mean by duality in dreams? Just that subject-object. I am different from these things. We, we experience that in dreams. Right? Are you with me? Yes. In the same way, because of maya, maya, through the mind, the vibration of the mind, appears as a duality in the waking state also. Here also, he says it's the, it's the mind basically. Then he goes on. Advayam ja advaya bhasam mana swapne na samshaya Advayam ja advaya bhasam tatha jagran na samshaya in, the, in our dreams, the mind alone, which is not to, not to means, in the dreams, what is there? It's just your, the dreamer's mind. You are there and you are experiencing something in a dream, but both you in the dream and what you experience in the dream, both are the dreamer's mind, you the dreamer's mind. Correct? You are sleeping in your bed and dreaming, but in the dream, you are there yourself with a body. In some place, in some time, experiencing other people and events. So that duality is actually the non-dual dreamer's mind. Which is not two. It's only one mind which is appearing as two. Similarly in the waking, it is the Atman, the non-dual Atman, which through the agency of the mind appears as the dualistic universe. So what Gaudapada has done here is interesting. Problem is samsara, at the root is duality, according to Advaita Vedanta. And now Gaudapada pushes it further. Can we narrow it down? Where is the problem? The problem of duality inheres in the mind. It is actually the mind which is practically the mischief maker, the, the troublemaker. So it, uh, the problem has to be dealt at at the level of the mind. Duality, non-duality, very philosophical, very metaphysical. And wonderful. But ultimately when you actually it comes down to our spiritual life, it's a question of the mind. So Gaudapada introduced the mind. Notice his first the first time Brahman, Maya, duality, non-duality. First time mana, mind, mind, mind is introducing this. So mind is at the source of our problems. And how do we deal with that? Keeping all this in the background, now let's look at what the mind does. Verse number 31st. So from now on, the new topic has started. 31st onwards. Non-duality and mind. Non-duality and mind. Wonderful um, and very immediately applicable uh, series of instructions. 31st. Please repeat after me. Mano drisham idam dvaitam, Mano drisham idam dvaitam, Yat kinchit sacharacharam, Yat kinchit sacharacharam, Manaso yamani bhave, Manaso yamani bhave, 
द्वैतम नैवोपलभ्यते द्वैतम नैवोपलभ्यते मनोदृश्यम इदम द्वैतम दिस ड्यूएलिटी व्हिच यू आर एक्सपीरियंसिंग इट्स 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 अ प्रोजेक्शन ऑफ द माइंड इट्स द माइंड मनोदृश्यम द माइंड अलोन अपीयर्स एज दिस दृश्य दिस ऑब्जेक्टिव यूनिवर्स ड्यूएलिस्टिक यूनिवर्स yat kinchit sacharacharam whatever you see living or non living literally it means moving and non moving whatever you experience see hear smell taste touch whatever you think about it's all mind here this mind appears as the duality which you experience and uh, uh, when the mind becomes no mind manaso hi amani bhave when the mind becomes no mind duality is not experienced dvaitam naiva upalabhyate duality is not experienced or duality is not um not seen or duality is not found okay this requires some explanation no mind amani bhava no mind so here we are introduced into the to the um fourth of the great themes in the mandukya karika the four great themes one is advaitam non duality no duality second is ajata no origination third is asparsha yoga no contact and fourth is no mind amani bhava non dual no duality no origination no contact no no mind advaitam ajata ajata vad ajata asparsha yoga and amani bhava advaitavad the doctrine of non duality ajatavad the doctrine of non origination um asparsha yoga the the way of non contact and finally amani bhava they all follow they are all deeply interlinked i won't explain now i've been touching upon it and in fact i gave i've given talks about all of these the essence of all vedanta one talk was there that's about non duality aspect of it the ultimate truth that was about the non origination aspect of it nabaddho na cha sadaka na 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 um that that one na vai mukta na sadaka that no origination um no 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 utpatti na cha utpatti like that no origination no no dissolution and so on so that was second one that was called the ultimate truth the third talk i gave was asparsha yoga it was called asparsha yoga mm. yes so asparsha yoga which talked about both of these asparsha yoga the way of no contact and also no mind both of we talked about in the third lecture the fourth one was about the fourth chapter of the mandukya which is later on anyway so the the idea of no mind is being introduced so that's going to be the subject for the next uh, few verses this is a special teaching of gaudapada very profound teaching it is the innermost core of spiritual life the most advanced idea of spirituality we have in the world in throughout civilization whatever we'll see um first of all you just made a very radical claim that all this worldly experience duality is because of the mind prove it so the commentator shankaracharya he introduces this verse kim pramanam iti anvaya vyatireka lakshanam anumanam aha he says the commentator says asks in sanskrit what is the proof that mind is at the root of all this sounds cool to say it's the mind but prove it the proof is given in this verse manodrishyam idam dvaitam entire experience of duality is a projection of the mind manaso hi amani bhave dvaitam naiva upalabhyate when the mind becomes no mind the duality is no longer experienced now if you put it this way it becomes like this um so no mind i gave a talk and i just freshly shaved my head before the talk and i saw the kind of comments on the youtube it said the talk talk was no mind so the comment said no mind is no hair <laughs> um it's like this 
imagine pot and clay. The pot and clay example which we use. Okay. Now, if clay is there, pot is there. Clay is there, pot is there. If clay is not there, what will happen to the pot? Not there. So can we say that clay is the cause of the pot? Cause means material cause, the substance. Similarly, when the mind is functioning, world is seen. When the mind is not functioning, world is not seen. When is the mind not functioning? Maybe in um, deep sleep, maybe in samadhi and so on. So the world is not seen. So can we say mind is the substance or at the, at the root of the world experience? Yes. You might say, just a minute, just because my mind is functioning doesn't mean the world is, is gone. Uh, if I am knocked out, if I am asleep, does it mean the world has disappeared? No, no, remember, we are talking about your experience of the world. Whether the world exists independently of experience or not is an entirely different question. We'll see, Gaudapada does not believe in any world outside your experience. But right now, uh, right now, this much you have to admit. If your mind is not functioning, you have no experience of the world at all. You have no experience of duality. In that sense, the mind is at the root of the world experience. Functioning of the mind. Okay, so far? This is called Anvaya Vetireka. It's uh, an argument based on, the English translation would be, agreement and difference. If one factor is present and the, then the second one is present, if the first one is absent, the second one is absent, then the first one is the cause of the second one. This is a method of agreement and difference. If mind present, you experience a world. Mind stops, you do not experience a world. So mind is somehow causally linked to your world experience. This much we can minimally say. So, let's understand this more deeply. What does Gaudapada mean by this? For him, the functioning of the mind and experience of the world are more, are more or less the same thing. Every thought has a content, as an object. So, um, here is a pen and I have a thought about a pen, vritti. And that alone al allows me to experience the vritti. Uh, here is a, a board and I have a board with vritti in the mind. And so that allow alone allows me to experience a board. And there is a man, a man vritti, a woman, a woman vritti in the mind. So the objects, pen, board, man, woman, sky, earth, ocean, whatever, big, small, whatever. These are objects and each of them corresponding to each one, there is a vritti or, or thought in the mind. Thought I am using in the most general sense. Uh, the movement in the mind corresponding to your experience, vritti. Now the sum of all vrittis is the mind and the sum of all objects is the world. Right? Corresponding to each vritti, vritti means thought, or let's, I'll just put thought. Corresponding to each thought, there is an object. And corresponding to each object, there is a thought. If you sum up all the thoughts, you get mind. If you sum up all the objects in the world, you get world. Right? And so... A thought is also an object. Right? right, to the consciousness. But right now, in our common sense approach. So every thought has a content. Without objects, there would be no thoughts. Okay? Without thoughts, you have no way of speaking about objects. How can you say an object exists if it does not come into your mind in any way? If, it, if your mind does not have a conception about it, it could be a fictional object like Harry Potter, but still your mind must have a conception about it. If there is no thought at all, you cannot speak about any object, about the existence of any object. It would be nonsensical to say that. So, thought and object are mutually interdependent. Mutually interdependent. This is what he means, the vibration of the mind and the world are the same thing. Gaudapada says, basically, thought, all thoughts together is the mind and all objects together is the world and the thoughts and objects, they correspond perfectly. Not that you have thoughts about all objects in the world, but whatever we have experienced, different people, different times, we have had thoughts about that. We have had movement in the mind. Um, and, so they are mutually dependent. 
and we will take that up in the next verse. We'll leave it at this. Basically, what he says is, in that case, if the mind is not there, thoughts are not there, the corresponding objects are also not there, or at least not experienced by us. This is what he calls no mind. Now, this no mind idea, it has to be understood carefully. No mind, this idea has to be understood carefully. Basically, by no mind, what is meant here is spiritualization of the mind. Not destruction of the mind. We'll see that next, next verse. Basically, by no mind, it is the spiritual management of the mind which is, which is meant. Um, the way it is approached in life, in spiritual life, depends upon your philosophy, upon your spiritual approach. For example, a bhakta, a devotee of God, one who believes in God, loves God, surrenders to God, how would a bhakta manage the mind? How would the bhakta deal with this? My mind creates samsara for me. What do I do? I surcharge my mind. I, I suffuse my mind with love of God, with divine thoughts, with the leela, the divine play of God, with my Krishna or my Christ. I fill my mind with divine thoughts, holy thoughts, pure thoughts, or at least I try to. That is my approach to mind management in the path of bhakti. In the path of, um, say, karma yoga, unselfish service, what is the approach to the mind? Instead of the mind being involved in its own subjective problems, my health, my wealth, my problems, my, my little insults and my pride and my ego, no. Be completely dedicated to helping others. So the mind is constantly thinking about how to help others. Not the subject, but completely given to others. That's one way of managing the mind. That's one way of dealing with samsara. I was just reading about this librarian. It was, um, came out in the news two or three days ago in, in South India. I keep forgetting the name of the librarian. Um, all his life, he... Uh, do you know the name? No. All his life, he dedicated his life to helping others. So he got a job as a librarian. And whatever he, he earned in that job, in a, in a government job, in a college, as a librarian, whatever he earned in that job, the entire salary he donated to poor students. Kalyan Sundaram. Kalyan Sundaram, yes. And he started an organization called Palam, which means, yes. means bridge. Yes, he's very well known. And all his life. And at one time he was working as a waiter in a small hotel to earn his living. So all his salary, he was 100% giving away what he owned. He did not marry and have the, a family because he felt it would be a distraction. At one point he was living like beggars on the platform of a railway station. Just to feel what the poorest people feel. And all his joy is in helping others. So finally the government recognized him many awards. And recently they gave him 30 lakhs or 3 crores of... Huh? 30, crores. 30 crores, 30 crores, which is a lot of money, which is like um, 30 million rupees and immediately donated it all. He said he was delighted to get that award. Why? Because he could give it away. And so he's, he's now imagine, I am sure that person is very, very happy. Very, very happy. Swami Vivekananda said, it is unselfishness which is more fulfilling. But it takes maturity to understand that. He says, his exact words, the bright ones come to it faster. The others have to struggle a longer time. That it is unselfishness. So this is one way of managing the mind. Again, this, we are not talking about Gaudapada's approach here. This is one way of managing the mind. Then there is a third way of managing the mind, which Gaudapada will refer to, which is the yogic way, the way of meditation. If the vibration of the mind creates the world for me, or the world of experience, control the vibration of the mind. Consciously, deliberately calm the mind down. Cessation of movements of the mind. Chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the cessation of the movements of the mind. Cessation of movements of the mind, cessation of the world. That is one way of ma managing the mind. The last way, the one which, which Gaudapada wants to recommend to us, which is really what he means by no mind, we will come to it in the next verse, is not by any of this, 
Not by any of this. Not by trying to shut the mind down. Let the mind work. You realize that underneath the mind, the reality of the mind and the reality of the world, there is one underlying reality, the Atman or the Turiya. The Turiya. It is the Turiya alone appearing as the waker's mind and the waker's world. As the dreamer's mind and the dream world. As the deep sleeper and the deep sleeper's darkness. So Turiya is the reality. When you realize Turiya is the reality, the mind and the world are appearances in Turiya. Like a dream for example. If you could realize the falsity of the dream and live in, lucidly in the dream, it wouldn't be a problem. According to Gaurapada, that is no mind. So that's what we shall see. What is Gaurapada's recommendation? How does one um, get to no mind? So we'll see that. Next. All right, let's just do the 32nd verse. The general approach to no mind is that it's spiritualization of the mind. It's not destruction of the mind. We'll see, we'll go deeper into it and see specifically what Gaurapada recommends. Do we have to meditate? Do we have to go to a lot of soup kitchens? Do we have to um, repeat the mantra, sing and dance? What? Or attend plenty of Vedanta classes? <laughs> plenty of Vedanta classes actually. <laughs> Anyway, that's coming now. Next. 32. Atma Satyanu Bodhena Atma Satyanu Bodhena Na Sankalpayate Yada Na Sankalpayate Yada Amanastam Tadayati Amanastam Tadayati Grahya bhaveta dagraham. Grahya bhaveta dagraham. Atma satyanubodhena. This is the key phase. Key phrase. By realizing the truth about the self. I am the one non dual consciousness underlying waker and waker's world, dreamer and dreamer's world, deep sleeper and deep sleeper's darkness. And that one, that is the truth. That is the reality of which the rest are appearances. That is Atma Satya Anubodha. Atma Satya means the, the reality of the Atman. The knowledge of non-dual Vedanta. Brahman alone is real. The world is an appearance. And I am none other than Brahman. This reali uh, realization. This is Atma Satya Anubodha. By this, the mind will become no mind. So let's see how. Yes. What did he say was the name of Anvaya in this context? Anvaya, means agreement. Mind there, world is there. Vetireka means mind not there, world is not there. Difference. Yeah. Anvaya agreement and Vetireka means difference. Alright, now let us see. Uh, just a minute. Ho hold on, don't forget the question. Um, you have you have a question? Who, who asked the question? Yeah, go ahead. What's the difference in the similarity between Zen and, and Tibetan? Zen and Tibetan Buddhism? Yeah. That's uh, not a directly related question, but it's a very deep question. Mm -hmm. I will uh, give a quick answer and yes. leave it leave it at that. A quick answer and leave it at that. Zen Zen Buddhism tries to achieve the breakthrough by circuiting the short circuiting the intellectualization of the mind, the, one, the intellectualizing process of the mind, the trying to think and understand and grasp it intellectually, Zen Buddhism tries to short circuit it and directly intuitively break through. Uh, they call it Satori. So for example, they'll give you a question to meditate upon where, for which there's no answer and they don't expect an answer also. Uh, to, to sit for hours and hours with sound of one hand clapping. What's the sound of one hand clapping? Not two hands, one hand clapping. And or what was your face before you were born? Uh, don't say well, you can look at the ultrasonogram in the head. <laughs> no, 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 no. Doesn't mean that. Even before you had a body, 
So what was your original face? So uh, questions like this which do not have an answer. Uh, they're called koans. And you sit with that. The point is to sit with that. If you come up with an answer and rush, there's a teacher who's waiting for you to come and give an answer. So he'll come up, so he gets an answer, he goes to the teacher and this is the answer and he gives a little talk about philosophy and the teacher has a long bamboo cane and he hits him in the head with that and go back and meditate. <laughs> the second time he comes running, even before he's opened his mouth, the teacher whacks him on the head, go back and meditate. Third time he's there, his face is shining, he has no answer and the teacher says, you have realized. Now see, if this path works for you, well and good. But it has to work or not work. And so I'm not a Zen, uh, one of our monks was a Zen practitioner. Alan Watts, whom I quote sometimes, so he nicely combines Zen Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. So that, that's one way. So Zen Buddhism is like that. Some of our early Swamis did not think much about Zen Buddhism. Swami Pavitranandaji who was here, a nun in Santa Barbara told me, many decades ago Swami Pavitranandaji was visiting Santa Barbara. At that time Zen Buddhism was very popular in this country. Um, so one of the nuns asked him, what is Zen Buddhism? Now Swami Pavitranandji had a very cryptic way of speaking. He didn't speak much. He said, what is Zen Buddhism? He said, perverted Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> now, make of it what you will. So, but it's a, it, it's a very well-known path and it's very popular. At one time, a, a lot of a wave of Zen Buddhism came to this country. Zuz Suzuki and others. If you go deep into it, in writings of Diti Suzuki and all, you'll find it's very close to Advaita Vedanta. So that's one way. It's not all these classes and intellectualization trying to understand. No, stop it. Stop trying to understand. There's the Zen stories, like uh, um, there are monks meditating outside the monastery and there's a flag flying on the monastery. The young monk, the newcomer says, look, look, the flag is flying. The flag is uh, flapping. Uh, uh, the, fl the um, uh, flag is moving and the senior monk says um, no it's not the flag which is moving it is uh, the mind which is moving no sorry it's, it's the it's the wind which is moving the wind is moving so the flag moves because of the wind it's really the wind which is moving a subtler answer the senior must monk he was meditating he said no it is the mind which is moving uh, because of the vrittis now the most senior monk who was retired and up and sick and in his room upstairs in the monastery, he looks out of the window. It's his tongues which are moving too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> a typical Zen story. <laughs> Tibetan Buddhism on the other hand is um, a full-blown system. Zen is very Japanese, very minimalistic. That's why that samurai and all, they loved it like a samurai sword cutting through, very minimalistic, uh, austere. And it's, it's, a, it's very, very Japanese in spirit, um, minimalistic approach, elegant, beautiful, uh, sharp. Tibetan Buddhism is just the opposite, it's maximal. So there is enormous philosophy, it's very close to Advaita Vedanta philosophy in fact. Many Tibetan Buddhists actually have told me that um, your teachings and what we learn, in fact one Tibetan Buddhist nun said, the pointings which we take years to come to in our tradition, you're just giving them out openly on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's very similar. Plus, there's a lot of ritualism. There's a lot of um, uh, profusion of med um, uh, meditation techniques, uh, rituals, uh, a full-fledged monastic system. So that's Tibetan Buddhism. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm doing an injustice to everything by saying these things. But <laughs> If a simple answer, just yesterday I was in Bryan Park outside the library and this lady came up, an American lady, she comes and she does this and says, are you Vedanta? And I said, yes. <laughs> well, thank you for your teachings. I practiced Vajrayana Buddhism. Vajrayana Buddhism is Tibetan, Tantric Buddhism. And um, so your teachings are very evocative for, for me. All right, so we'll leave it at that. Now, um, back to no mind. Atma Satyanu Bodhena. How do you become, how do you get this no mind? No mind is not destruction of the mind. 
how do you get rid of samsara of the world let's take a broader question before getting rid of the mind making the mind no mind let's make the let's make the world disappear there are two ways one is take the example of a pot pot negation how do you negate or destroy a pot why i'm saying this is a, this example i've used earlier that's why i'm saying this one is take a stick and break it and smash it so you break the pot the other one is if you have attended lots of vedanta classes then you will see that oh it's actually clay if you touch the pot you are touching clay if you see the top of the pot it's clay inside it's clay outside it's clay in fact it's clay through and through there is no pot voila the pot is gone so pot negated by seeing its cause its reality see as clay then what do you say clay is the reality of which pot is the pot is the insubstantial name and form is the unsubstantial name insubstantial unsubstantial unsubstantial name and form pot is the unsubstantial name and form and uh, clay is the inner reality in the same way world negation one way is through you're trying to destroy the world one is you wait for the world to be destroyed in the hindu cosmology it's called pralaya yeah you might call the big crunch one day the world will be uh, modern physics has two options one is called the uh, big crunch where if the forces of gravity become powerful enough they'll pull the entire universe back together back into a singularity from which it all began that's one theory but bill told me that it is outdated now another one is the heat death theory that the world universe keeps spreading and spreading and until ultimately because of the second law of thermodynamics there's entropy increases until everything cools down and everything is gone so i mean everything stops basically anyhow in sanskrit it is called pralaya pralaya means destruction of destruction of the universe cosmic dissolution so samsara is troubling you want to get rid of samsara you wait several billion years but the problem is it will take a long time to come end of the universe and so many lifetimes and that is according to hindu cosmology or indian cosmology hindu buddhist jain that's not the end to other universes will begin after that and modern physics also seems to support that there are multiple universes so that's one one way the other way is how do you get rid of samsara and all its sufferings um our own personal little pralaya every day you fall asleep deep sleep sushupti that's also another way no world you are not there world is not there problem solved so are we supposed to sleep all the time it's not as silly as you think what else is alcohol addiction what else is drug addiction you see the the way we try to solve our problems notice either we try to stultify the mind drug it drink into oblivion so that i don't feel anything that's one way we try to this no way of seeking peace because that will just increase tamas and that tamas increases dar- uh, darkness and suffering so that's one way the other way is overload the mind with pleasant sensations and take drugs uh, take the other kind of drugs which excite you um a series of um nice experiences uh, what they call binge watching television there's a new new term binge watching <laughs> continuously all day and night you watch somebody oh, playing video games somebody says i can play video games for 6 hours at a stretch um so you continuously you do that but even that is not a solution really and at the end of it you just unhappiness has increased um in fact somebody told me elon musk has a new company neuralink something has somebody heard of it very interesting you heard of it yes so he's saying 
ultimately all our enjoyments happiness is within us right whatever is it no it's out there all the shops and broadway and all of that times square all of that is happiness no but ultimately it has to come into the mind you have to experience it for it it to make you happy right if you have to experience it it has to come in through your body mind system and that's where elon musk comes in he says forget the world outside if i can provide the experiences directly to your uh, your neural network artificially stimulate your then you will get the same uh, joys which the world is providing you and perhaps much more refined much more direct even more direct than what drugs can provide you directly and he says in a safe way we can stimulate your brain cells your your neural network and so you'll be happy for what nothing for nothing but you'll be very very happy <laughs> and endlessly happy smiley face really there's a company look it up not in a bad way he says that there is real prospect for this there are so many experiments the classic experiment of a rat which uh, they stimulated the pleasure centers of the brain and so there is food pellet um so there is one lever if the rat pushes food pellet will come it will eat another lever if the rat pushes there is a little electric shock to the pleasure center of the brain they wanted to see what the rat would do the rat kept on pushing the pleasure lever to so getting little bursts of pleasure in the brain food no no eating until it collapsed of hunger then it might eat a little bit again start the moment it feels a little better again start that so it, that is extraordinarily uh, directly and extraordinarily uh, addictive because we want that that's one way of doing it notice again it is basically the mind what elon musk is saying he is saying the neural network because he is talking about brain and nervous system god apart goes to a little more subtle the whole thing ultimately boils down to the mind to the mind samsara it's a great lesson to learn godapad is not interested in this he is going to say something else here but he says the great lesson to learn i mentioned this earlier a monk in himalaya said one of the most beautiful things i've heard shant man mein bhala samsar kon dekha hai whoever has seen samsara in a peaceful mind profound you might not think it well, what's so great about it it's very very interesting it's just the opposite of what we think we think the world disturbed me that's why my mind is disturbed samsara provokes me samsara disturbs me samsara attracts me samsara repels me and so my mind is provoked disturbed attracted rep- rep- repelled unhappy and this the yogi said you are absolutely wrong it's just the other way around it's because your mind is disturbed that's why you have samsara <laughs> whoever has seen samsara in a peaceful mind same world same disease same pain a yogi's mind and a worldly person's mind the worldly person sees samsara and pain and suffering and misery and frustration and the yogi sees peace and serenity how the difference is in the mind samsara disturbs me because my mind is disturbed not that my mind is disturbed because of samsara is a very great insight again remember not at all what godapada is saying we no we have not yet come to that so one way is to directly stimulate the mind and try to make it as happy as possible and nilon musk has taken it to the logical extreme forget the world very godapadian extreme forget the world i have a machine this will make you happy until right the rat like the rat you collapse and die out of happiness out of sheer happiness yeah. so no he didn't he doesn't say i'm giving him bad press he never says you're going to die it's safe for 199.99 dollars or something like that and i'm joking but anyway so they are making progress um but ultimately this is also it leads to samsara it doesn't lead to freedom right, yeah. you are still dependent on a particular state of the mind for your happiness here is the thing yogis say by a conscious control of the mind in sanskrit niruddhamana 
one can through samadhi. There are various states of mystical experience through which one can safely and indeed wholesomely attain true lasting upliftment and peace. So the yogic way, samadhi. Same effect, better effect, wholesome, lasting, uplifting. Um, in one you become a wreck and in the other you became a, become a saint. This is the difference. You're transformed in the other one. In fact, this was the point of difference. Aldous Huxley, he was very close to Swami Prabhavanandaji. But I think he wrote The Doors of Perception, I think. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah. yeah, That's where they fell apart. See, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, it does say that these ex experiences are attainable by certain drugs. It mentions it. Patanjali Yoga Sutra says, by artificial means you can generate. And in principle, it should be possible because they are objects. They are subtle objects in the mind. It's an experience. Experience can be generated by other objects. But it warns against doing these things. Because it is not spiritually uh, ennobling. It's not lasting. And it will ultimately do no good. So when, at that time, they didn't know the effects, bad effects of this. Timothy Alpert, um, then, who became Ramdas? Uh, no, Timothy Leary, R Richard Al Alpert. Richard Alpert, who became Ramdas? Um, Timothy Leary, um, then uh, Aldous Huxley too. So they started experimenting with LSD and other um, drugs to generate, their purpose was good. Can we have um, literally out of the mind experiences? So Swami Prabhupada warned him against it. He told him, absolutely not, don't do these things. They were very close uh, in that Vedanta Society of Southern California where he wrote a classic book the perennial philosophy. In fact, in our Trabuco Canyon Monastery in um, Orange County in, in Southern California, there's a li library still there where uh, Aldous Huxley used to work and wrote that book, the perennial philosophy. Some of his books are still there. And the library is also very nice, very old-fashioned kind of library, you can see. So, so Swami Prabhavanji said, the yogic way is best through a disciplined course of exercises to attain deep samadhi, that is the solution for mind and samsara. To, sh uh, to shut down the mind in samadhi and yet be completely conscious, you see yourself as consciousness free of the mind. No world is experienced, no mind is experienced and yet you have not fallen asleep, you are there. None of which Gaurapada recommends. So what does he recommend? The third, the, the, his alternative. Just like see, break the pot, this is like break the pot. See as clay, pot negation, world negation, see as Atman. You see, what is the world? In Mandukya Upanishad, what is the world? It is the waker's world. It is the dream world. And the potential darkness of deep sleep. The, all of these appear and disappear in the one consciousness which you are. You realize the waker in the waker's world, the dreamer in the dreamer's world and the deep sleep experience, they are all constituted of nothing but consciousness, Atman. In Atman, because of Maya, these appear and disappear. They have no independent reality. Just as the pot has no independent reality apart from clay. Clay is substantial, part is name and form. Atman or consciousness is substantial. Name, uh, world is name and form. Samsara is name and form. Mind, mind. Where is mind? Is it within the world or within Atman? It's a part of the world. It is the world. It's part of the world. And being part of the world, it is also name and form. What is Gaurapada's idea of no mind? By realizing that Atman is real. Atma Satyam, you realize mind is mithya, mind is false, mind is an appearance. When the appearance nature of the mind is realized, then you have dealt with the problem of duality. If you have dealt with the problem of duality, you realize the non-dual nature of the, of the Atman. Non-duality is freedom, duality is removed, um, bondage is removed, 
it's like this. So this idea you've got, what is the way to deal with the world? There are two ways of dealing with the pot. You take a stick and break it. There are these different ways of dealing with the world. You can wait for the end of the universe or you can fall asleep or uh, drink, drug yourself to oblivion and erase the universe. Or you can try to overload yourself with pleasant engagements in some way or yogic samadhi, the spiritual way of erasing the universe. This is recommended, very good. But what Gaurapada says, in this universe itself, you see that Atman, existence, consciousness, bliss, Brahman, your reality is the reality of which the universe is an appearance, including mind is an appearance. And that non-duality will save you from samsara. Now let's exp explore that little further. What does he mean by seeing the Atman as the reality? Take the case of dreams first. In the dream you are there. You are there. And you are experiencing objects of people in the dream. So, the dream mind, just as your mind is experiencing the world here, in the dream also, the dream mind experiences dream objects. Is this clear or is it not visible? Yeah. Dream mind experiences dream objects. And remember, this is the nature of the world. What did we say? Mind and objects, thoughts and objects. That's the world, world and the mind. That's what's going on. So in the dream, this is what happens. By dream mind, I mean your mind in the dream. When you are there, you don't know it's a dream. You are experiencing a dream and you feel that I have a body, I have a mind, I have got senses, I am experiencing a world, I am thinking about it, enjoying and suffering. So that dream mind, it experiences objects in the dream world, flowers and people, your own body, sensations. So that's what's going on. But what Gaudapada says is, what happens when you wake up? All the thoughts in your dream mind and all the objects which the thoughts were about, all of that is actually the waker's mind. Waker's mind means you the one who sat up on the bed and said, oh, it was a dream. You were actually not that person in the dream. And those objects in the dream were also not actual. Both were imaginations in your mind. You were lying in the bed and dreaming. Are you with me so far? So, by a realization of the waker's mind, the mind behind the dream, both the dream mind and the dream objects become falsified. In Sanskrit, mithyatva nishchaya. Yeah. And what happens next? In Vedanta, what he is saying is, the same thing for the waker's mind too. Sorry, Swamiji, could you repeat that please again? Which one? In the dream, you are there in your own dreams. When you experience a dream, you are there, right? You are there, you feel that I am here. You don't know it's a dream. You feel it's real. Um, you are there yourself. You see a body of a mind. <coughs> you see other people. And your mind is having thoughts about them. Are you with me so far? I'm describing a dream. When you wake up, what happens? All those objects are nothing but projections of your mind. Whose mind? The waker's mind, not the person in the dream. The person in the dream thought, that's a world outside me. This is a world inside me. This is my mind. That's the world. These are my thoughts. Those are the objects. When I see a pen, in my dreams, when I see a pen, I see it's a pen, an object, and here's a thought, thought about a pen. But when I wake up, what do I realize? Suddenly, when I sit up on my bed, oh, that pen. It was imagined in my mind. There's no pen there. And the thought of that person in, in the dream, that's also imagined in my mind. Both the mind and its objects, thoughts and objects, mind and the world, were both imagined in the waker's mind. Is that not? It? I'm just describing a dream. It's an example. Now let's apply the example. In the waking world, what Advaita is saying and Gaurapada is saying, 
What is the way to attain uh, no mind? Here is the waker's mind. What is this waker's mind? Right now, what you have got now. <laughs> That's the waker's mind, what you feel now. And there is the waker's world. Or waker's objects. Waker's world, let us say. What is the waker's world? This. So you feel, here is a world. Here I am. And here are my thoughts about the world. Bo they are all appearances. Just like pot and clay. All of this is an appearance in Atman, in consciousness, in the Thurium. Seventh mantra of the Upanishad. Uh, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, come and go in one awareness, in one consciousness. That consciousness itself is appearing as the waker's mind and the world of, of waking objects. Once you realize this, then this waker's mind, remember, when you wake up from a dream, dream is gone. When you wake up from this enlightenment, when you wake up from this, this will not go. This will still keep on appearing. What will happen is, a real duality will now keep on appearing as an apparent duality. Like watching a movie. So what will happen now is, you realize, oh, I am not this one. I am the Atman. You'll realize this, clearly. Right here, right now, in this experience itself. This will continue to be there. But, this will not be real anymore. Nor will its objects be real. This mind... Here is the thing. This mind is called no mind. No mind is not destroying the mind. No mind is realizing the mind is none other than Brahman, actually. First, we have to separate the mind from Brahman. I am not the mind. Mano buddhya hankara chittani naham. I am pure consciousness of the nature of Shiva. Chidananda rupa shivoham. Then you realize this is an appearance. These are not two entities. I alone am appearing as the waker's mind and as the waker's world. If I alone am appearing from this point of view, how many are there? From this point of view, there are many. Duality. But from this point of view, how many are there? Not two. Not two. From the clay point of view, how many things are there? Not two. The pot is not a second thing. It's only one. From the waker's mind, when you look back upon the dream, how many things are there? Are there thousands of people, thousands of entities? No. A vast space and a vast long time? No. It's only the waker's mind, which appeared in that, all those ways. One appearing as many. After enlightenment, the Atman alone appears as all of this. This is called no mind. One Swami in Chennai, he put it very nicely. There are many misconceptions about no mind. Amani bhava, many misconceptions. Why? Because sometimes the terminology itself. Uh, Vidyaranya Swami, another great teacher, Panchadashi, he, in his book Jivan Mukti Viveka, for no mind, he uses the term Mano Nasha. Mano Nasha means destruction of the mind, negation of the mind. So people think this sort of enlightenment means mind is. You become mindless, <laughs> retarded or something like that. No. One Swami in Chennai, he put it very nicely. He said, enlightenment means that this mind, he says, it should not be destroyed. It cannot be destroyed and it need not be destroyed. What did he say? It should not be destroyed. It cannot be destroyed and it need not be destroyed. Where does, where does this destroyed thing come? Because when you hear things like no mind, destruction of mind, you actually think the mind will go. You'll become a zombie, a physical body without a mind. Is that enlightenment? No. So, should not be destroyed. Why not should not be destroyed? How is it possible to be enlightened without a mind? The sages, if they clearly have a body, what do they become? Like shells without... Like computers without the software, hard disk erased. Is that enlightenment? Mindless zombies? Not at all. Enlightened person, so holy, so loving. Where is all that love? Love is usually in the mind. But enlightened person has no mind. So where is all that love? Gone. Gone. How can he be enlightened? So full of wisdom and compassion. Where is the wisdom and compassion if no mind is there? 
and a mind is not there, where is the teaching? Where is Mandukya Upanishad? Clearly, mind, if body is there, if the liver is functioning, heart is functioning, lungs are functioning, then mind is also functioning. So mind should not be destroyed. Even after enlightenment, should not be. It's a very unattractive proposition. If I become enlightened, I'll be a zombie. Who wants to become an... <laughs> One more candidate for the psych ward. <laughs> what happened? Became enlightened. Attended too many Vedanta classes. Yes. Samadhi is a state which is achieved and then you come out of it. Yes. So is it right to think that after Samadhi, if someone was to go on that path, they revert back to this state of no mind when they come back? Uh, I'll touch upon that later. Let me just complete this one. Then I'll relate it back to Samadhi. Um, so, um, should not be destroyed. Clearly. Cannot be destroyed. How can the mind be destroyed? At least in, in Indian ideas of the mind, we have body, mind and Atman. Sthula Sharira, Sukshma Sharira, I forget the current Sharira now. Atma. What dies at the death? death? Body dies. And our belief, not only our belief, the belief in every religion, is a subtle body goes on. Even in English when you say, um, what is death? He gave up the ghost. In India you say just the opposite, he gave up the body. But there is something giving up something else. So there is something that continues after death. Even death cannot destroy the, uh, the mind. It's the mind which goes on. Subtle body which takes up other bodies. It's the mind which is living life after life. Imagine how indestructible the mind must be to live life after life. And in Hindu cosmology, if you, if you are not enlightened, if the, if the end of the universe comes, billions of years later, stars and planets will all disappear. Everything is merged back into Maya. No bodies anymore, no worlds, no bodies, nothing. Everything is merged back into Maya. Even time and space are occluded, are, are withdrawn. Matter, energy, time, space, nothing exists. Only Lord and His Maya, God and, and God's Maya. In the Maya are merged the minds of all of us. They are not there individually, but still merged. Sri Ramakrishna put it in a very simple way. He said, after the harvest season, the granny, she goes to the field and she picks up the seeds and puts them in little cloths. And next season, she will use those cloths to plant the vegetable garden again. So who's granny? Mahamaya. She picks up all the seeds. What are the seeds? Our minds in, in storage. In zip format. And they are, they are all withdrawn. And our karmas, our accounts are all there with, with Mahamaya. When the universe starts all over again, we are back into play. With all our past karma and everything. And this will go on until we get enlightenment. In fact, the only thing that can destroy the mind is enlightenment. Uh, at the death of the body, when the body falls apart, the subtle body, the mind also falls apart. Uh, for the enlightened person. For the unenlightened person, mind goes on. Life after life. World after world. Universe after universe. So, that, sound, that sounds better. If the mind goes, then where am I? You are the infinite. The mind is like a cage. The body is like an even worse cage. The body cage falls apart after every life. The mind cage will still remain until you get freedom into your infinitude. So, um, it cannot be destroyed until the death of the body for the enlightened person. Yes. Swamiji, what happens to the person if he has a good intellect, intellectual understanding of this knowledge hmm. and has lived pretty moral in his whole life? Yes. Uh, but not attain to the full blown realization? Yes. What would happen to? That person goes on to other lives. In the 6th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asks this. Suppose I get all of this and I try, but I do not attain enlightenment in this life. What will happen to me? And Krishna says, you will go on to the higher worlds and then come back again into this world and try again until you attain enlightenment. So you will progress in spiritual life. That's what will, what will happen. Um, there is no regress for such a person. But the enlightened person, when the body dies, the mind also will dissipate back into nature. But until that point, by enlightenment, the mind is not destroyed. What happens to the mind and the world is it is falsified. It becomes an appearance. Uh, enlightenment is realizing Atma Satya. 
जगत मिथ्या कैनॉट बी डिस्ट्रॉयड एंड नीड नॉट बी डिस्ट्रॉयड नीड नॉट बी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू अंडरस्टैंड सम हाउ पीपल गेट द फीलिंग दैट एनलाइटनमेंट लिबरेशन सेल्वेशन मोक्ष माइट मीन नो माइंड डिस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ द माइंड इरेजिंग द वर्ल्ड Vedanta tells you you don't have to erase the world you don't have to erase the world experience yoga tries to erase the world experience bhakti tries to replace this world experience by a better experience of heaven nice i'll be with god better you suffer <laughs> in fact there's a description in medieval uh, christian tracts that one of the cause one cause of the enjoyment of the senses uh, of the saints enjoyment of the saints is the presence the holy presence of god but another cause of the enjoyment of the saints is that when they look down from heaven into the sufferings of the sinners <laughs> in hell they will feel oh good i am saved <laughs> <laughs> that's replacing this world with a better world heaven the yogi does heavens hells earths all erase stop yogi in samadhi i remain as pure consciousness no experience of the world stop nirvikalpa samadhi but the moment you come out of nirvikalpa samadhi oh no i'm back again <laughs> and you're left with a wonderful impression of having nirvikalpa samadhi but what gaudapada is saying here is that even when the world is going on you realize this world what is this world it's me i alone am appearing as this world when i look at the snake and the rope or, or say uh, when i look at the water in the uh, mirage i thought it was a real water now after enlightenment i realize that it's a it's an it's an optical illusion but when i look back upon it it happened to swami vivekananda when i look back upon it what do i see water it looks like water but i know that it is not water so the appearance of duality goes on the mind appearance goes on the world appearance goes on the enlightened person sees all of this as nothing but atman the self and i alone am appearing as all of this and then there is no problem the real source of problem is real duality satya dvaita an apparent duality is not a source of problem rather it's enjoyment it's fun it's theater it's pure drama it's you yourself experiencing yourself in all these ways this uh, hold on to the question the story of the princess of kashi which i have told number of times yeah. when the um, enlightened person and that you know the story most of you know i'll repeat it quickly the the there was a theatrical performance in the court of a king and one of the roles was the princess of kashi uh who was supposed to be a little girl and the queen said dress up the prince who was a little boy um a- as that princess and so the prince was dressed up as the princess and he looked so cute the queen said to the court painter paint this picture of the prince this dressed as the princess of kashi and a portrait a portrait was made years passed and the prince was all grown up maybe 20 years old now and one day while exploring the the cellars of the palace he found this portrait and this girl it says princess of kashi and dated 15 years ago and she he thought she must be my age and she's a princess and he fell in love with her he <laughs> said i want to marry this princess but he's shy he can't tell other people and then his mother and father the king and the queen are worried what happened to the prince finally a wise old minister takes him aside and says prince tell me what your heart what's in your heart why are you so unhappy the prince says um that uh, I am in love. Oh very good. Who is she? Oh she is the princess of Kashi. Princess of Kashi, very good. A princess, very good. Where did you meet her? Oh, I haven't met her, but I have seen her picture um painted long ago, but she is my age quite clearly. Then the minister seems to remember something and said, "Picture. Where did you see this picture? Take me there." The prince takes him to the cellar and shows him the portrait and the minister says, "Prince, you need to sit down." <laughs> This is not the princess of Kashi the princess whoever she is I'll marry her This is not even a, a, a girl you can marry 
it is you that thou art, Tattva Masi. And he ex tells the whole story how this thing was done. The, the portrait came about to be. The moment the prince realizes what happens to his, does the portrait disappear? No, it's still there. But what happens to his desire for the princess of Kashi? Gone. Gone. Why? Because he sees there is no object for the prince called the princess of Kashi to be attained. Why? Because she is married off? No. Because she is engaged to some other prince? No. Huh? Because there is nothing apart from him there. He alone is there. Though it looks completely different. Look at the verse. Here it says, Because of the absence of anything to be attained, the mind does not try to attain anything apart from it. That is no mind. Na sankalpayet yada. When the mind does not make sankalpas, does not recognize a, an entity apart from it and think about it. What is sankalpa? Thought, object. The way we are doing right now. Thought and object. This, this is very subtle philosophy. The mind will continue to function. How? Just as it is functioning now. Your intellect will work, your memory will work, uh, your mind will work. Um, your all your abilities will be there body will work everything will be there except nothing will be there <laughs> yeah, because it you realize it is the atman alone appearing as the mind and its objects because of that though all functionality is there you realize every bit of it is atman i myself and therefore there is nothing here to be attained grahana there is nothing here to be discarded Nothing to be attained, nothing to discard. What will you discard? It's you. What are you trying to so hard to attain? It's you. Purna Hamta. In Kashmir Shaivism, it's called Purna Hamta. The infinite I. Without any limit. And therefore, you are completely fulfilled about as far as the universe is concerned. You're completely fulfilled. Nothing in this universe can disturb you. Why? It's you. Nothing in this universe can attract you separately. Why? It's you. And all of it now becomes drama or theatre or an extension of your own joy. It's your own bliss overflowing as this universe. So it's delightful then. It becomes delightful. There is no longer any necessity of erasing. Does the prince feel, now I have to burn the portrait? Does the prince feel that I have to tear this portrait sh to shreds? No. There's nothing, it's just me. Just me. This universe, every bit of it is, is, is Brahman. Is Brahman. And somebody said... There is a change in the mind also. Yes. In mind. Change in understanding. Yeah. There, is a, there is a tremendous upheaval in life. Your whole idea about the world, purpose of life, everything is turned topsy-turvy. You are one with everything. There is no further... Individual striving for fulfillment. You are, you realize you are ever fulfilled. You are the infinite. What else could you want? What else could you, uh, what, what is there which is lacking in your life? Every bit of this world, good or bad, is you yourself. Swami Vivekananda said in his poem, One alone exists. These are, these are his words. One alone exists. It appears as nature, soul. One alone exists. It appears as nature, soul, object, subject. Whom will you be angry with? Whom will you desire or, or be, be annoyed with or um, uh, attract or be repelled to? Because it is ultimately these are names and forms. Utility will continue. Experience will continue. Activity will continue. After realizing that the pot is made of clay, does it prevent you from storing water in it? Earlier I could store water, but it's not a pot anymore. After attending the Vedanta class, now I know it's clay. I can't put anything in it. No. You can go on but absolutely knowing that you can... Say, while saying that it's not a pot, you can easily go on behaving as if it's a pot. Similarly, you are... You realize your infinite nature. Death will touch what? The body. Changes are always at this level. They are not real. The re you are the immortal, changeless self. 
So it still looks the same, but your understanding of it is completely revolutionized. That beautiful story about the sun, Wittgenstein, the great German philosopher, I really like this. He was British, I mean, from, from Austria, but. So the story goes, um, he was in Cambridge. One day, he was walking out, outside his class, and the lady who has recorded the story, she says, suddenly he looked at the sun, and he said, Wittgenstein, he said, I wonder why the ancients thought that the sun moved around the earth, instead of the other way around. It's the earth which is turning, right? From west to east. That's why it seems that the sun is rising in the east and going to the west. This earth which is rotating. So why did the ancients think that the sun is moving? And the lady said, why? Because it looks like that. It looks like that. It looks like that and therefore they thought it's the sun which is moving and not the earth. <laughs> His answer was, what would it look like if that were not the case? It would look exactly the same. What he means is, it looks exactly the same. And <laughs> if the earth were turning and the sun were not moving around the earth, what would it look like? Just like this. If you are, if it is dualism is correct, you are a separate reality and the world, you are all, these are all separate reality from you. What would it look like? Like this. If it is truly non-dualism, one infinity appearing as many, what would it look like? Like this. <laughs> That's the amazing thing. You need not erase it. The truth is, from that non-dual perspective, it's perfectly alright. It is non-dual, hence no samsara. The appearance of duality is not samsara. Because, because what is samsara? Birth and death. The law of karma. Um, good actions and bad actions. Uh, attraction and repulsion. Raga, Dvesha, Pravritti, Nivritti, Dharma, Dharma, Punar, Janma. This is samsara. None of it will be there when you are enlightened. So when you realize non-duality, though the world continues to appear and work in this way, you are delivered of samsara. So perception. Ah, a great change comes internally. I think it was Eliot who said um, that that we shall sail forth and see new seas and so many things and very beautiful language and he says when we come back again to the same place but we shall see the old with new eyes now the whole world vishwam uh, etad nandanavanam the entire this world itself is transformed into the heavens of indra uh, of the world i mean the, the heaven the, the gardens of heaven you realize that this is the most mature idea of spirituality. All others try to shift or change something. Change something in the world outside. Replace this world with a heaven. Or change something in your own perception. Replace this perception with a new perception. Or stop the perception, yoga. But here, let everything remain. Only knowledge, ignorance is replaced by knowledge. Just understand what it is and you are delivered from it. Clay is, so yes, exactly. We don't know what Atman is, so how can you keep saying that this is Atman, be it? Come to the class. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real uh, Come to the class. But interestingly, the question was, see, I do not know what Atman is. Uh, Vedanta will say, stop. Atman means I, me, myself. Are you saying that I do not know what I am? I do not know what I am. If you say, I do not know what I am, Vedanta says, oh, very good. It's a good place to begin. If you say, I know what I am, that's much harder. First, I have to disabuse you of the idea that you really know what you are. Because you, if you say, I know what I am, if I say, I know what I am, I will probably point to this one. Say, okay, tell me, what are you? I am this. Then start, Vedanta ABC. I am not the body, why? Because it's a drishya, because it is anitya, because it is jada, because it is anekam, because it's bahya. So many reasons and so many exercises will be there when you begin to see, okay, maybe I'm not this physical system. But I'm the mind, I'm the person inside the body. Yes, that's correct. Alright, let's take that up. Same logic and exercise. We have done this any number of times. Then you begin to appreciate what the Atman is. You are the Atman right now. 
See, if everything was perfect, you don't need a Vedanta class. What does the Vedanta class do? Does it change the world for you? No. Does it change your experience of the world? Not even that. A yoga class will change the experience of the world for you. Swamiji, sorry, I disagree with that. It Wait. does change the, your experience of the world too. Because you know what you teach us here. When one I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, wait, wait. You are all right, correct. But at core, what does it do? If you say it changes the experience of the world, say a class in astronomy, which taught you that the earth is rotating, not the sun. Sun is not revolving around the earth. Did it change your experience of looking at the sun? You're still seeing the same thing, but now your understanding is completely different. Similarly, as at, least, at least from a very common sense point of view, you're still the same person. Other people will see, you're still seeing the same world. Yes, you are a completely changed person inside because of that knowledge. Yeah. And that's knowledge learned in a textbook. In a Here the knowledge is about yourself. Because it is about yourself, I know what you're trying to say, because it is about yourself, it feels like a tremendous change in your experience because it is, yeah, you can say your experience is changed. In that sense, you can say your world is also changed. Right? The, what I'm trying to say is that the prince who looked at the portrait of the princess of Kashi, after the knowledge, did he see a different portrait? Same portrait. But his entire perspective was changed. Similarly, your entire perspective, right here, right now, in this thing, and Atman, we can never say that I do not know myself, because you are you. But what is the nature of I myself, without reflection, I have taken myself to be a body. It's like this, when I take myself to a physical body, it's a physical universe. The body is physical, universe is physical. I interact with physical entities, other bodies, objects, space, this is physical. But then I realize, like Elon Musk has realized, all this so-called physical universe, I'm experiencing in the mental. If the mind were not there, what Godapada says, if the mind did not vibrate, no physical universe would be experienced. So what I'm experiencing now is I'm experiencing inside. No doctor would, would deny that also. It's the data pouring in through all our senses, collected, collated, assimilated and represented in our minds. How? After the neurons, what happens? No doctor till today knows. Somehow it is presented to us, the mind. So at that level then, I am a mind experiencing mental objects. So no, no, there's a physical object, no. There's no physical object there anymore. It's the physical, so-called physical object is in the mind. Just like you recognize it's possible in dreams. Go one step further and you're at the Atman. The entire mind appears and disappears in you, the awareness. That awareness is not an object, it's the pure subject, can never be objectified. The last object is the mind. Or let us say even more subtle, is the absence of the mind. That is the path of yoga. When you make the mind absent, there is the possibility of recognizing yourself as the witness of the presence and absence of mind. So that Atman is, once you are, we are educated into it, there is something to be done. As you are saying that we understand what is clay and what is pot. Obviously you understand because that's why the example is used. If one cannot understand the example, there is no point in giving an example. <laughs> right? So I understand the example. But it's meant to show something. That something similar is going on here. And to understand that, one must um, study this. Yes. So how does the enlightened mind simultaneously be limitless and also function? Is it the Vyavaharika? Yes, distinction. Limitless, the, constantly uh, and yet... The enlightened mind in its real nature is limitless because the enlightened mind is nothing other than Brahman. But it's still the mind that is enlightened? Yes. Mind is enlightened means it is Brahman. Brahman alone is actually the mind is also nothing but Brahman. In the early stages, the first stage I have said, there is a stage of separation. I am not the world, not the body, not the mind. I understand, begin to understand what the Atman is. But next stage, you must reduce the world, body and mind back into Atman. Right? But the same mind functions at both levels. Yeah, both levels means? Paramartika, no, mind is not Paramartika. Paramartika is only Brahman. When Brahman is 
walking, talking, eating, uh, this is Vyavaharika. Here it is body, mind. But the difference is, we think it is body, mind and world. This is duality. The enlightened person sees it is the same Brahman appearing as body, as mind and as a world. This one. For us, this is theoretical. If I ask you, is, does this make sense? Or waker's mind and waker's world? You'll say, yeah, that's one way of looking at it. But I'll say, if this makes sense, so this part we will put a question mark here. This is, you are saying it, Mandukya is saying it, Godapad is saying it, but really, what is that? The Atman. If you're saying that, we are. At, this is ignorance. This is at the level of avidya. What Vedanta, the whole of Vedanta is trying to educate us into seeing this, this background existence consciousness bliss right now. In a dream, in a dream, if you did not know it was a dream, I am dreaming and seeing the dream world. And if somebody keeps telling me this is a dream, at the background of everything, background, there is a mind, you are sleeping on your bed, you're not walking or jogging in Central Park. Yeah. There is no lake here, there is no park here, there is no body here, there is no jogging here, uh, there are no birds chirping and um, uh, flowers blooming. It's all mind. It sounds something out of science fiction. But when you wake up, when you wake up, will all your perceptions be true or with what that person said in the dream, will that be true? That will be true. You realize all of it was in the mind, yes. How is this? Consistence with mm-hmm. that yes. that philosophy and this philosophy exactly the same. They work together or no, no, it's the same philosophy, exactly the same. What, what are you referring to? That yeah. Upanishadic verse, Sri, um, mantra which Sri Rama, uh, which Swami Vivekananda was fond, he, was, he used to repeat in the in America here itself. And it's basically the essence of um, of um, uh, religion and spirituality. You find a part of it in Shvetashvatara. The whole thing which Swami Vivekananda would say is Srinvantu Vishve Amritasya Putraha Listen ye children of immortal bliss um, Vedaham Purusham Mahantam I have realized that infinite being What is that infinite being like? Aditya Varnam Tamasaf Parastat Blazing forth like the sun Like the spring sun outside Blazing forth with the radiance like the sun Beyond darkness Blazing forth like the sun not like the material sun, is the sun of consciousness, of awareness. Beyond darkness means beyond ignorance, beyond death, beyond suffering, beyond duality. So what is that infinite being shining forth like the sun? This one. Where have I become aware of it? Here itself. Vedaham Purusham Mahantam. I have realized that infinite being. Then what's the use of realizing this infinite being? Infinite. Look at the words. Mahantam means infinite. Anantam. Infinite means there cannot be anything else apart from this. It is all that there is. Therefore, this waker's mind and waker's world must also be this one only. What, what is the use of all this prayojanam? Tim prayojanam. What is the use? Tameva viditva ati mrityumeti. By realizing that, one goes beyond death. How does one go beyond death by realizing that? I realize I am not this little person. I am that infinite being. This one does not die. I am this one. Therefore, I do not die. Okay. Yeah, go on. Uh, does the Upanishad talk about how to become the no mind or in practical terms or does it just talk about Atman? <laughs> If you ask Gaudapada, this is the most practical thing he has said. See, this is Advaita Vedanta. This is like the final teaching. It's, it's what is called a direct teaching. After all this, uh, no, this is very theoretical. Can you tell me practical? Practical means? And the Upanishad will say, okay, I get it. I understand the case. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Sit straight. Fold your legs. I can't. My knee pain. All right, sit on the chair. Back straight, breathe like this, close your eyes, calm the mind. Can't calm the mind, it's so restless. Mm, understood. 10,000 mantra, Japa. Repeat the mantra 10,000 times a day. I, I fall asleep, gets distracted. Mm, open your eyes. 
put a picture of Sri Krishna in front of you. Look at the picture so that you don't fall asleep. It's so boring. Okay, here is a puja. There's flowers and they have to cut the fruit and take a bath and make the garlands and sing a song and then do the puja. Then sit and repeat the mantra. How many times? 10,000 times a day. How long? 40 years. <laughs> then come back. Okay, come back, then what? Tattvamasi, thou art that. <laughs> there was this Vedanta student who came to a teacher in, in, Uttar, in the Uttarkashi, to the teachers in the Himalayas, and a young student. And he said, give me enlightenment. And the teacher said, Tattvamasi, that thou art. And the, the student said, oh, I know that. It's in this Upanishad. And the other Upanishad says this. And the, that one says this. But Buddhism says that. Then the teacher said, hmm, send him to the cow shed. He's going to clean cow dung for... <laughs> now that's his job. He, he said, oh, it's horrible. And he's a, uh, he's a college student. He doesn't, <laughs> no, hasn't done this dirty work. Anyway, he wants enlightenment. What can he do? He sticks it out. Years pass and he is grumbling and he says, when do I get enlightenment? And finally, 12 years later, a guy comes and says, the guru has called you, come tomorrow and take a bath first. <laughs> <laughs> so next day he goes and says, yes, master, that thou art. And this person says, yes, I get it. He might be scared of being sent to the back to the couch. <laughs> No, but truly, truly, and that's why Vedanta, it takes a little getting used to. I call this the finishing school of spirituality. It's not working, this sounds so uh, theoretical and abstract. Okay, I'm going to enroll you in um, Vipassana meditation, 10 hours a day, for one week. Yeah, that seems nice. Okay, try it. What happens is, why this doesn't work? There are different layers of problems and complications in our mind. And so a vast amount of spiritual technology has been developed. That's why Tibetan Buddhism is spectacular that way because it has a whole range of techniques. Starting from the physical, to the mental, to the more subtle, to the very subtle. Everywhere designed to tackle particular problems. Advaita Vedanta is basically the the um, peak of the Everest. The peak of the Everest is not a comfortable place. Kashmiri Shaivism, for example, another system of Hindu philosophy, is a very positive and very full spectrum approach. They call, there are four levels. There is the direct path, and then there is a path of meditation, there is a path of rituals, and there is a path of action and puja. And at the beginning, the master says, if by the direct path you realize what you are, the rest is not necessary. Doesn't work, start where you are. See where the shoe pinches and start there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I feel that the, the dream that we get, the dreams that we get, uh, is just the highest manifestation of the infinite grace that God gives us because every night it kind of points us to the real model of how this is going to work. We just don't give attention to, to this correlation, the correlation that we did today, right? The dream person and the dream, oh. and then wake up, and the waking person and the super conscious state, this correlation. Right. In fact, the simplest thing you need to do is, to whom is this appearing? What is, to whom is this appearing? Where we get caught up is, a simple turn. We are always interested in the objects of experience. Here is the world, I am interested in this. Then what else should I be interested in? What about the one to which the world is appearing? Vedanta says, turn inwards. To whom is this world appearing? As the Vedanta teacher said, the master, somebody went with a lot of problems in life. And the teacher shouted, I am not interested in your problems. How cruel. No, I am not interested in your problems. I am interested in you. So there is a difference between you and your problems. What are you? Who am I? What am I? In dreams too, we are fascinated with what we are dreaming about. 
good dream bad dream basically it means the contents of the dreams but what about the dreamer what vedanta says first understand who the dreamer is who the seer is who the experiencer is and then you will see what is experienced seen dreamt is nothing apart from the seer from that experiencing consciousness it is one seamless reality Last question. Uh, this, this might be a stupid question, but... Uh, Usually the best say, ones. <laughs> let's say there is one individual hmm. who realizes that their true nature is Atman, gain enlightenment, and then is living this you know, appearance of the world through you know, what was his body and mind previously. But if Atman is one, hmm. there's the same Atman in every individual around him. Why wouldn't that person be experiencing the world after enlightenment through the eyes and ears of every person? Yeah. Or do they? I'm going to <laughs> subcontract these. <laughs> what is it called? Uh, outsource outsource this, these questions. Simple. Uh, the answer is simple. Experience. You know why we ask these questions? It's very interesting. The reason is we are so identified with the mind that we think, all right, I have understood what you are saying. No, you have not. You're still thinking of the mind. As with this mind, I understand the, what's going on in this body and this mind. To understand what's going on here and to understand what's going on in the mind, you require the mind. Similarly, I, the consciousness, in each body mind, am the recipient of the experiences of that particular body mind. So when I realize myself as pure consciousness, I will know that I am the same consciousness in all bodies and minds. But this I will know, this knowledge is also in this particular mind. That's why one person is enlightened. It's not that everybody will be enlightened by the same knowledge. Yeah. To answer this question really, viscerally, to understand it clearly, if you can really understand it, that's just one step away from enlightenment. To the difference between consciousness and mind will have to be understood. Alright, let's stop here. This, this, this will go on. Let's hear the question. Yes. I just want to talk to you before it's too late today. That's all. Okay. <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astu By the way, Vivekananda's approach is all of this. Use the jnana approach of Gaudapada, use the bhakti approach, use the meditation approach of Patanjali. Yeah, so all of them, use all four yogas. You don't have to be exclusive about it. All right. And this topic will continue. The no mind topic will continue in uh, the next few verses. Very beautiful verses are coming up.